How do I feel when my website and applications come under attack? Thanks to New Star Security, I feel confident. Their full ultra secure suite of always on cloud security services enables me to be confident that our website will always be available to our customers whenever they need it. New Star Security does more than ensure my company's online presence is ultra secure, it ensures my peace of mind. New Star Security, always on, ultra secure. Welcome to the Oh Hell No podcast, where I, Keisha Nicole, delivers a daily dose of passion, purpose, and struggle by interviewing people who are living their best life doing what they love. Here on this podcast, every Oh Hell No moment serves a purpose. Now let's get started with the show. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Oh Hell No podcast. Today I have two amazing ladies and I'm so excited to finally get to interview them. I have Gina Dubé. <laughs> she is a serial entrepreneur and venture capitalist. And I have also Dr. Leslie Apgar, and she is a board certified OBGYN, and she's also an entrepreneur. And we're going to get into their business and um, talk a little bit about them personally and what they're doing in their careers. So welcome, ladies. Thank you for being on the podcast. Oh, thank you. It's our pleasure. Yeah, thanks for having us. No problem. So I'm going to start with Gina. So Gina, tell me, what was the worst job you've ever had? I worked at a pharmacy when I was in high school. And people took a lot of pleasure in picking on the youngster there. So when you worked at the pharmacy, were you interested in going into a pharmaceutical career or was it just something to just get some money you didn't really it was have? Just, you know, one of those high school jobs where you were raising a couple dollars and it was interesting back in the day, you know, it was very different back when I went to school. Yeah, I can imagine. So what was the job that made you launch full speed ahead into entrepreneurship? I was fortunate enough to take a company public in the 90s. And when we sold that company, I went into a venture fund. And that was probably the best job I had ever had, being able to look at company after company and what they did right and what they did wrong and invest in them. And, you know, it's interesting as a woman, we funded 49 companies, only one was female owned. And so I started my company, um, most recently Pearl in the early 2000s. We sold to Performance Health in 2008. And it was a ice pack company that I started in my basement. And when we sold, we had shipped 20 million ice packs. So it, it's been a great run. And I retired before Leslie and I started this business. Oh, yeah, she retired for 10 minutes, Nicole, not for very long. Wow. So wait, you, okay. So was that the first business that you started before you became a venture capitalist, the ice packing business, or was it some? No, I um, was, I'm an engineer by trade. Okay. So prior to the VC market, I ran sales, global sales for a company called Trusted Information Systems, mm -hmm. which we took public and sold to McAfee mm -hmm. in the late nineties. Wow. Okay. Uh -huh did the venture fund for 15 years. Wow, look at that. So um, as a serial entrepreneur, what has been the worst business idea? And when did you figure it out? Like, have you ever had, you know, a business that you started and you realized that, oh my God, this is terrible, it's not gonna work and, you know, gave it up? And if you did, when in that, like at what point did you figure that out? You know, I've been really fortunate. I always think of ideas and things to do. And so after Theropearl, I retired until Les and I started this one. But I, I've been really lucky. I got to experience success and failure through the venture fund. Yeah, you sure did. Mm. So out of that, can you share any businesses that you <laughs> might have invested in or might have saw and said, no, we're not going to do that because that's just not a good idea? You know, we saw all kinds of things, as you might imagine. And mm -hmm. people came in and uh, a lot of folks 
wanted to jump on the entrepreneurial bandwagon but had no business sense and really had little execution ability. They had great ideas. And what you quickly found out in venture is you bet on the jockey as much as the horse because you want somebody who is nimble enough to change courses or to fix the problems if it if they occur. Mm, I love that you said that. I had a conversation with um, a couple of friends like a couple of months ago. And one person was telling us how he met this lady on the plane and she made these cakes and she had appeared on the Oprah show and all these other shows and but her business still wasn't really going anywhere. And he works for he does something in his business where he can, if you do things like that, he can hook you up with a mass production of some sort. So he re you know, said to the lady, I'll get you um, this deal, or I'll try to get you this deal. If you put together this package, you know, and send it to me and whatever. And the lady never followed through on sending over the information. And we got into this whole debate about, you know, why her business is not successful, right? Even though she was on all of these major platforms and had the opportunity and the cakes were good, she just couldn't get it to that next level. So I love that you just made that point because that was my point. Like, you know, you got to have the whole, you know, thing going on. You It can't just be, oh, I make great cakes. Like it has to be more than that, you know? Back in the day, they used to say, build it and they will come, just like Field of Dreams, the movie. And that's certainly not the case anymore. You have to be able to execute. You have to be able to use the social media platforms that are out there. And you have to have an eye to the bottom line because no cash equals death. And that's what many entrepreneurs don't understand. Wow. Great advice. All right, so now we're going to shift gears and we're going to talk to Dr. Leslie Apgar. She is an OBGYN, and I've been dying to talk to an OBGYN. So when did you decide that you wanted to become an OBGYN? Was this early in your life or later on? So I wanted to be a vet. I wanted to um, probably be a large animal vet for horses because I grew up with horses and they are expensive. And I thought, well, in order to afford horses, I'll have to go to grad school and I'll just go to vet school. And there you have it. Well, it turns out I love animals way more than people. And so I quickly realized that I was going to have to go to medical school. And while I was in medical school, I fell in love with surgery. I just absolutely was mesmerized by it. I loved my plastic surgery rotations. I loved my orthopedics rotations. I loved derm. I paid as much attention to everything as I possibly could. But at some point, I decided that I didn't want to fight the boys club, which is still rampant in the field of general surgery. Mm. And I decided I will practice or I will I will move to a specialty that employs reverse discrimination, meaning that patients want to see women almost exclusively. And so I was really fortunate to be able to match in OBGYN and I got the best of both worlds. I had um, medicine. I had patients who were very interested in their health and were fairly compliant. And I actually also got to specialize in minimally invasive surgery. And I got to do that cosmetic stuff that I really loved while I was in school. So it's been a very interesting course, but it's one that I couldn't have um, been more happy about because it's led me to where I am today. Wow, that's amazing. So when you decide to be a veterinarian, you have to go to medical school and actually go through that whole thing as like a medical doctor to perform on people? So when you go to vet school, it's like you go to your undergraduate and then you would apply to vet school. Mm -hmm. And so I had gone to um, school to be a vet. And so I was a zoology major. And when I was within those first four years of school, I realized, okay, I don't think vet school is going to be the right thing for me. I'm going to go to medical school instead. Mm. So it was, it was way before I had applied. Um, It was just sort of like as I was figuring out my, my life course at the tender young age of, uh, what was I, 19 or 20? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, pretty young. Uh, yeah, I decided against vet school um, and decided to go to medical school instead. 
Wow, that's amazing. I always love that because I find it so interesting when people at a young age are able to follow this like passion inside of them to do what it is that they love and end up doing it and loving it and having a career years and years and and really enjoy what they're doing. So um, what do you love the most about being an OBGYN? I get to take care of people throughout the entire age spectrum. So when I was still delivering babies, that was pretty remarkable. I got to bring new life into the world and experience the most incredible, precious, sacred moment that exists is is that moment when you present the parents with their brand new baby. So I got to do that. And then I got to take care of teenagers as they came in for their first appointment maybe before they went to college and I got to remember what it was like to be a teen and counsel them about being safe and drugs and alcohol and sex and STDs the whole thing and then I got to see the 20 year olds and the 30 year olds and the 90 year olds and everybody in between so I got to really experience people's lives with them and I am forever humbled because of that. Yeah, that's an amazing thing. So what do you like the least about being an OBGYN? Well, what I did like the least about being an OBGYN is the fact that it's not about the medicine anymore. It's about the insurance companies and the reimbursement. And so one of the things that was kind of like the straw that that, um, broke the camel's back for me was something called the electronic medical record which is something that really puts a distance between me and my patients because it's more about me and my computer and the codes that I'm typing into a form so that I can get reimbursed later than in taking care of the patient. And for me, that was an incongruity that I couldn't reconcile and it um, really ate away at my soul because the best way to practice medicine is to sit with somebody and look at them and see them and hear them. And the new model of medicine does not embrace that, nor does it allow for it, quite frankly. They want it to be a factory. The more, the better, the faster. And that just isn't my style. So it was fairly easy to decide to jump into this crazy new arena with Gina, even though she was very nervous about me. (laughs) quitting my OBGYN job entirely, but, uh, I was more nervous than Leslie was Yeah, (laughs) because you spent your whole life to become a doctor. You spent like a third of your life. Yeah. Right. And I kept saying, don't step away. Don't step away because you'll, you'll regret and resent. You know, it's funny. (laughs) You and my husband both were so concerned that I would miss the surgery part because that truly was what used to blow up my skirt. Nicole, I used to love to be in the operating room and, my uncle is an orthopedic surgeon, and when I was younger, he told me that it would be amazing if he could just have patients come in on a conveyor belt and not have to do anything except for just operate all day. And I didn't understand what he was talking about until later, but I, I was a little bit cut out of that same cloth, and I really, really loved the operating room. And happily, I do not miss it. Uh, I am very engaged uh, in a lot of other ideas and things all all day long, all week long. So it doesn't give me much time to miss anything. And I'm learning and growing in brand new ways now. So could never have predicted it. Yeah, absolutely. You're on your next chapter. That's pretty amazing. Wow. So Now we're going to talk about the next part of you guys' adventure, right? So you both are co-founders of the Greenhouse Wellness. It's a medical cannabis dispensary. I want to know, how did you two meet? Well, Gina, when I moved into my home in 2002, brought over a freaking pie that she had baked herself. (laughs) And I thought, here comes Betty Crocker. This is impossible. <laughs> like, who is this person? Um, how, like, do people actually still do this? But <laughs> Gina is from West Virginia. And if nothing... We do in West Virginia. Yes, yes. And she carries <laughs> forth that um, unbelievable kindness. Um, and it was really... Um, it made a, an imprint in me, for sure. Because the two of us couldn't be any more different. 
Wow. So you come over with the pie, Gina. <laughs> Just to say hello. I mean, I had new neighbors. I was excited about it. And, you know, we our friendship grew gradually through the backyard. I mean, we were doing the same things, both working mothers. I had the top respect for Leslie with what she'd do. She had night call. She had a young daughter that sometimes would come my way. Mm -hmm. It was just a really good and easy friendship. Mm -hmm. And it's been a hoot. It's been really interesting. I mean, Gina gave me the courage way back in 2007 when I was contemplating opening up a medical spa because my patients were complaining about abnormal hair or spots on their skin or just they wanted to look more youthful and they wanted me to be the one that did these treatments for them. And Gina was always just a cheerleader. And she says, you, you'll, you'll do great, Leslie. You, you absolutely should do it. Um, I had never met anybody like Gina. Um, but now that I can look back at our successes, I get that it's the tribe that you surround yourself with. Yeah. And that you have to surround yourself with people who are succeeding and winning. And Gina is certainly that person for me. Um, and it's funny. We are total opposites. Yeah. Leslie's tall. I'm short. <laughs> you were on the West coast. I was West Virginia. Mm-hmm. You know, it's engineer doctor. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so she thinks there's a solution for every equation. <laughs> She's so funny. She, I can remember having conversations with her and just looking at her like she was some sort of alien because she thought <laughs> medicine worked that way. And it, it's still entertaining to us how we interact so well, but we, I guess we stay in in our respective lanes. Like she's the business engineer spreadsheet girl and I'm the science girl. Right. So there you have it. And it's worked really well at greenhouse because by staying in our own lanes, the business is covered. Mm -hmm. And it it was interesting. They awarded a 102 dispensary licenses and probably only a handful went to women. Mm. And we were told from the beginning we were wrong because we wanted a truly medical dispensary. We said when it goes recreational, we'll bid for recreational. But right now we want medical. And we were just generally excluded at the beginning. Oh, yeah. I mean, I can't (laughs) tell you how many times we were told you're wrong. That will never work. You girls have it all wrong. I know. Oh, my God. How many times were we told that? And You know, I don't know that there's another duo who's a doctor and a engineer who and a venture capitalist who got together and formed a dispensary. So I don't know that anybody can sort of judge us for that. But we think we put together a model that is really intelligent. Number one, it runs like a business and it's running really well. Thank you, Gina. And number two, it is set up almost as if it is a residency program so that all of the people who work for us are trained in the medicine of cannabis. They're forced to, whether they want to or not. A lot of them do have recreational experience, but they don't know a lot about cannabis. And so it's pretty fun to watch them learn and grow out of the gate. And then we can educate all of our patients and the community and the other doctors in the world. So it's, it's been very satisfying I guess we listened to ourselves and we just jumped. So who had the interest initially in cannabis? Well, neither one of us. (laughs) I mean, it's like such a silly thing. I uh, was at my medical spa and I was taking care of a patient. Um, Again, like I said, I've taken care of these patients throughout their lives, right? So these are patients I've known for a long, long time. And um, one of them approached me and said, hey, we're going to bid in Maryland and I'm just very passionate about this industry and we'd love to bid you as our medical director. Are you up for that? And I was like, sure. I mean, that's kind of an odd thing, but I can see the holes in Western medicine and what Western medicine is unable to do. And obviously we have a huge opioid problem here in Maryland and I hear that cannabis can help get people off of opioids. So yeah, okay. That's kind of a weird request, but sure. And then the conversation evolved into a, well, we're going to need capital and do you guys want to contribute and blah, blah, blah. So I pulled Gina in and I said, please don't waste Gina's time. She's the real deal. This will be very embarrassing to me if you get her on this conference call with your people on the West Coast and this goes poorly. And I don't know why I thought that, Nicole, except for the fact that as a woman, 
maybe so often we're just discounted um, or not considered. I'm not sure, but I definitely remember telling my patient this and she assured me, don't worry, don't worry. It'll be fine. So it wasn't fine. So we were on our way back from playing tennis, which we try to do on Wednesday nights. And like most women, we're cramming two things into one time slot. So on the time we left tennis to the time we got home, we took this conference call. And I said to the fellow, can you explain to me the return profile of this investment? And he said, oh, honey, you would never understand the math. Mm. And I was like, he did not. And then I, of course, was just dying, like cringing. Like, I can't believe, like, obviously, they didn't do their due diligence and figure out who Gina is. And what <laughs> right. Her is like, she could run circles about around any of you people. And uh, so we were completely mansplained to and completely discounted. And um, so at that point, Gina and I stopped listening because, like, I don't want to listen to some guy browbeat and tell me, you know, pound his chest and, and show me how great everything's going to be. And I just need to pony up the cash and keep quiet. So I, with my tail between my legs, went home. I apologized to Gina. She was gracious as always about it. No, never mind, Leslie, it's not a problem. And then I hadn't even gotten home and you called me. And said, huh, let's bid it our damn self. I, you know, what happened is she got pissed, is what happened. <laughs> oh, hell no. We are not right. going to do this. Oh, hell no. Exactly. Oh, hell no. So I didn't know what an RFP was, Nicole. It means request for proposal. Yep. I had no idea that there's this whole terminology. I mean, you know, doctors don't have to do that. We um, had 10 days yes. to bid it. And this thing was due in 10 days. And um, here's the two of us with no cannabis experience. Um, nothing who looked at each other and said, why not? Wow. Let's try it. Let's just jump and see what happens. You know, Gina's confidence is, I think maybe contagious. Um, it is to people ask me all the time, why in the world did I say yes to this? But, um, I think it was the right thing, the right opportunity at the right time. So we sat down 600 pages later, tossed it over the wall. And a year later, we're told that we won. And no one was more surprised than we were. Well, we'd forgotten about it, quite honestly. I mean, it had been <laughs> a year later, and the state wasn't necessarily getting any um, commendations for their efficacy and for getting this thing rolled out. And so we really didn't know what was happening with it. And we'd gone on to do other things. We just It wasn't even in our brains anymore. So when we found out we won, of course, we were delighted because – we love winning, right? It's great to win. But then we were terrified because now <laughs> what do we do? Because there was no endocannabinoid system when I was in medical school and we didn't n learn about it. And I'm now in charge of this and I've got to teach everybody else. Well, crap, I better get educated myself first and quickly. So when you win um, a bid like that, that means that you can operate and I don't know, I guess uh, grow cannabis and uh, sell it to customers for, I guess, medical purposes. Is that what that means? In the state of Maryland, you bid separately for a grow or a processor, mm -hmm. which means you take the raw product and create vapes or tinctures or edibles, or you can dispense. And we want a dispensing license. Mm. So we're on the front lines with the patients who come in and they want to feel better. We're the ones that they go into the shop where they have a conversation with us. We talk about their medical problems and their cannabis history and experience. And then we talk to them about all the different ways that they can medicate with cannabis. And then we sell them whatever they need, whether it's flour to smoke or vape or tinctures to put under the tongue or elixirs to drink, or we have innumerable tablets and capsules and gummies and balms and things for, you know, um, skin, even bath soaks and salts. I mean, it's crazy how much stuff there is now. Yeah, it's a lot of stuff. So yeah, how expensive is it to get into this business? Because I always hear like it's millions of dollars to, you know, be a part of a cannabis. It's millions of dollars. Yeah, millions of dollars. <laughs> So that's true. It's not. <laughs> yeah. That is true. And it is absolutely the hardest business in which I have ever been involved. It is so regulated. And what people don't realize is for the privilege of play, playing, we pay $40,000 a year just to have our license. Wow. In addition to that, finding space 
is difficult, if not impossible. No one wants a dispensary in their building. I mean, so nobody, premium. nobody wants to rent to the drug dealers, right? <laughs> right? Even if and it's legal. <laughs> what yeah. we quickly realized was while it's legal in Maryland, it's not legal to the federal government. And so we can't do things that normal people can do. For example, we can't write checks. We can't use credit cards. We, most banks won't take us. As a matter of fact, when we first got the award, my bank called me up and said, we're inviting you to leave. And I said, excuse me, well, you own a dispensary and that's illegal. And I'm like, but I'm not banking with you. What does not matter? Now, this is the bank that held my mortgage for 35 years, my kids, children's savings accounts. And I said, when you asked all the guys to leave, I'll leave too. That's insane. And they never called me back. But, you know, we also are faced with what's called 280E accounting. And this is a little known feature, and I'll put that oh, in air quotes. feature, okay. Of the cannabis industry. Because we're federally illegal, even though we're state legal, we pay a premium in income tax. We can't write anything off. So our effective tax rate is nearly 70%. Because in most businesses, you can write off cost of goods sold, plus labor, plus marketing, plus rent, and then you pay taxes on your profits. We can't write any of that off. All we can write off is the cost of the product. So we pay taxes on everything. Mm, that is crazy. And that is what is going to put about 30% of dispensaries out of business within the first two years because their models don't accommodate for that. So you remember how we were told you're wrong, girls have it all wrong, you're doing right. this wrong. One of the things that we've been doing apparently wrong from the get-go is running our business like a business and paying attention to margin and paying attention to, to the math. Us growing for taxes. Yeah, for I mean, like, growing. you know, it's just like it's it's really good business practice. And quite honestly, there's a lot of people in this industry that don't necessarily adhere to that. And so it's um, it's been very interesting to um, – I'm not going to criticize anybody else. I'm just going to say, listen, it's been really interesting to watch the market mature <laughs> and watch other dispensaries that really uh, on first appearances really seem to be killing it, but now can't pay their taxes. <laughs> I <laughs> love how you said that. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I guess we're very comfortable being quote wrong. Right. We're, we're, we're loving the success that's coming from being wrong all the time. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But you know, I applaud Leslie because by having a partner, it's easier to have courage. Mm. <laughs> I, I think guess. if you do it by yourself, yeah. you can self doubt. But I look at Leslie, and if we're wrong, we're wrong together. So <laughs> well, it's, you know, it's, it's really interesting to Nicole because I think Gina and I obviously have been in other businesses with partners, and it, it doesn't always end well. And you really have to be careful about who you partner with. And one of the things I can say with certainty is that I would do anything for Gina and That's she knows that. And I know that she would always be there for me. And it's, it's so goes beyond this business. It's just like life. And yeah, we have this crazy cannabis connection and crazy cannabis empire now, <laughs> but um, it is so important about who you go into business with. And we definitely had the benefit of a long runway of shared experiences before we looked at each other on that fateful day and decided to, to bid for this dispensary. So what do you think, makes the relationship that you guys have work professionally aside from the you know the friendship because like you said one you have to go into business with the right person but two sometimes being in business with people especially friends can go left really quickly so what do you think keeps you guys grounded and keeps your friendship intact I mean, happily we're evolved enough that our egos don't get in the way because the ego is like a can be a real problem. And it's just not about being right. It's about doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, like very rarely, Gina and I will disagree about something. And it's so comical when we do, because it just never happens, um, that we start cracking up. And it just, like I said, it's not about the ego. Like Gina can do it her way. And that's fine. Like I've got other fish to fry and other problems to solve. And Gina, lets me handle the medical thing. I don't, I don't cross out of my lane. 
Like it's just, it's so (laughs) easy to just trust that the person who's in charge of that particular aspect has got it. And then we run things by each other all the time. And it, it's rare that we don't have, like, here's an example, Nicole. I could say, pick a number between one and a hundred and Gina and I would both say 35 and we don't know how that happens all the time, but it just does. It's just eerie and bizarre and weird. We have had such unique and varied and different backgrounds getting us to where we are and our schooling was different and the things in our brain are different. And yet when faced with the same situation and the same decision making tree, Gina will come to her answer. I will come to my answer. We'll talk about it and we'll giggle because it's the same answer. You know, our, our motto at the dispensary and in life is in a world where you can be anything, you must choose to be kind. And most of our decisions we make based on doing things the right and the kind way for our employees and our patients. And that doesn't always mean that it's the best for us. Right. But we come down on that same side. And that is so reassuring and so confidence building when you're in a business. Yeah. And and I also have to say, Nicole, the reason why we know what we're doing is because we've done it wrong so many times <laughs> At least before, once. right? Maybe twice. <laughs> like we've we've had things that didn't go well. We've had relationships that didn't go well. We've had businesses that didn't go well. Like we've we've definitely and we've watched, right? Mm-hmm. A ton of other people who've been doing things as we would say wrong. So it's it it does help when you have a lifetime of experiences that you can draw from and they do give you courage to to proceed but Gina and I I think have gotten very comfortable with the concept of just jump and um, we will be just fine but I have to say we have lived in discomfort for Mm -hmm. the last three years oh god it's hard Mm -hmm. to run a federally uh, illegal business Yeah. So tell me about that. Like, what's the most difficult aspect aside from the financial stuff and um, finding a location? What else would you say makes it a difficult business? Well, you know, it's funny when we first got the business three years ago compared to now is like eons of different of difference Mm -hmm. because it was stigmatized then. You know, it's interesting. I used to get um, not I don't want to say dirty looks necessarily, but my colleagues at the hospital or at the office were like, what in the ever living hell are you doing, Leslie? Like you are, is career suicide, what are you doing? And now three years later, they're either coming to me as patients or they're sending me their loved ones. So it's interesting what breaking into a brand new industry is like, um, being having the courage to do something that's so fringe that you're getting a lot of grief about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, compared to now, that's been very interesting, but like we can't accept credit cards, right? Because it's a federally illegal business. So we would be breaking the law if we took federal, if we took credit cards, right? And Jean and I have firmly held to the concept of we're not going to break the law while we're breaking the law. Right. So we really keep our noses as clean as possible. Can you take cash app or like what, um, Venmo, No, you can't do Venmo. We can take cash Um, because anything that crosses the federal wire or the state lines Mm. is an offense. Then you're then you're committing Mm -hmm. a felony. And so we really don't want to be drug traffickers. That's not what we're trying to do. So people have to actually come in and pay cash and that's it. Yeah, we actually do have ATMs in our space and we also take debit. And which there's is, CanPay, which yeah. is a cannabis application on the phone. It's kind of like PayPal, but it's especially for the cannabis industry, and it works yeah. really well. Uh, but you have to have already downloaded that app and done what you needed to do to sync your checking mm-hmm. account with your CanPay app, et cetera, et cetera. Right. But um, it, there are ways around it, and um, but it's hard. It's, it's just, very hard. It, everything's hard. Like you have to deal with how do I get my, I mean, thank God we have a bank, right? right? A lot of, a lot of states, they don't allow banking at all, but we had one bank that we're very grateful to here in the state of Maryland that agreed to bank with a certain number of cannabis businesses and Gina being Gina really quickly nailed them down before other people were kind of thinking about it. And we were lucky enough to get one of their accounts. So at least we have a place to put the, the cash, but right. 
you're still talking about like taking all the day's deposits and putting them in a bag and getting them to the bank. Mm-hmm. It's a lot. Like normal businesses don't have to worry about those things. Right. What about like the CBD oils? Is that still considered, you know, cannabis or whatever, or is it a little less um, strict? Well, in Maryland, we can't sell CBD unless it's grown and tested in Maryland. Mm -hmm. And so we can't have regular CBD in the dispensary Mm. under Maryland law. And yet I can sell it at my um, my medical spa, and I do, and it's wonderful, but it's just silly the way the, the rules are. And Maryland is good and in a lot of ways and that they are they have been and still are so strict about their testing and on all that and it's because they're interested in patient safety and I applaud them for that but they're also missing the point of trying to get good quality CBD available for patients and there should be a way that the state of Maryland can verify or validate somebody else's certificate of analysis that was done at a lab in another state and say that that meets the Maryland standard and that process is not yet in place. And so we're a little bit behind in that regard. So as entrepreneurs, what do you guys keep an open mind about and what's non-negotiable for you? Loyalty and integrity. Mm -hmm. Um, Integrity is absolutely one of those points that you have it or you don't. And if you don't, we don't want anything to do with that person. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. Uh, Before we started this, we made the decision that because we have choices, we're only going to do business with people that we genuinely like and that we genuinely like spending time with. We and we trust. And we trust. And it's interesting because, as I'm sure you can imagine, everybody wants to be a part of this industry. They may not necessarily understand how much money is at stake when people want to buy in or they want a part of it or whatever. But everybody wants to be an investor. But you know what? Not everybody is sweet and kind and easy to work with and level-headed. And so it's just been interesting to stick to our guns and to say we approach the world in a certain way, which is with love and with gratitude and with kindness and Therefore, that's the circle that we're going to stay in. I don't blame you. I like it. <laughs> and we love the fact that you're doing this. Yeah. I mean, you're, this fits right into it, Nicole. It's like like attracts like, right? Absolutely. Yes. We uh, love the fact that you're doing something new and innovative and on your own terms. And we applaud you for that. Yeah. And we love that you're female because that's Thank our you. whole thing is that we're just lifting each other up everywhere we go in whatever capacity. Absolutely. Yes. I embrace that. I receive it and I love it. Thanks ladies. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about your businesses and the different products. So I don't know if I'm going to say this right. I'm always mispronouncing things, but I promise you I went to college. Um, <laughs> bl- <laughs> Blaseva. Blasiva is correct. Okay, so Blasiva is a soothe pen, right? And uh-huh. it looks really cool. Can you so, tell me what that is and how you came up with that? So Blasiva is actually derived from two words, bliss and sativa, which is uh, one of the strains of cannabis. It means uplifting. And the very first endocannabinoid hormone in our bodies that was discovered was named anandamide, which is after the Sanskrit word for supreme joy or bliss, which is ananda. So we wanted to give a nod to the bliss hormone, and we wanted it to be uplifting for women, so we came up with Blasiva as as our brand name. When Gina and I entered this market and were embracing the public and, and helping them and watching them as they came in, we were a little horrified because the industry is very directed toward males and has a really silly way of naming the strains that don't mean anything, but they were really off-putting and awkward. And we decided very early on, there's nothing for women. I know women, (laughs) like I definitely know what women want. 
let's make a product for women specifically. And we did. And our very first product was called the Balance Pen. And that was a one-to-one -one ratio of CBD to THC. And it was for what our patients were asking for, anxiety and sleep. So that's why we did the Balance Pen. And we put specific terpenes in to give the effect that we wanted. And the patients were overjoyed. They were delighted. They would come in, we would run out, we'd get another shipment in, they'd come in and buy bags of them. And some of their husbands and their boyfriends and their significant others also tried it and loved it. And it's not that we were excluding men, but there are pl plenty of products out there that are designed for men. We wanted to really appeal to the ladies. And so we wanted something that was discreet, but upscale, so you could indulge in your vape pen instead of a glass of Chardonnay and have it smell and taste the same. Mm -hmm. So the experience with Blasiva's balance pen is you can have vanilla or you can have cucumber lime. It's the equivalent of a deep breath or a glass of wine. It's not a huge, um, psych it's not heady. It's yeah. just, it's a, it's enough to take the edge off because like I would always talk with my patients and kind of giggle all those soccer moms don't have coffee in their cup on the sidelines. They've got wine or they've got vodka or who knows. And so what a better alternative to have a placebo pen in your pocket and just kind of, it's a healthier way of letting the stress of your day go away so that you can focus on your kid playing soccer and not the, on the fact that you want to throttle your boss or the fight that you had with your coworker that day or whatever it is that women are thinking about. So that was the first one. And then we wanted to target pain because so many of my patients have endometriosis or chronic pelvic pain or even menstrual pain, painful sex. Yes. All the, the pain that women endure. And so we came up with the soothe pen, which is uh, like a periwinkle color and has the terpene limonene and citronol in it, which are um, citrusy flavors and it's uplifting. So much higher THC component. It's about twice the potency of the balance, but it's a different ratio of THC to CBD. And the reason we specifically put it together this way is that when you get a heavy dose of THC to combat pain, it oftentimes makes you want to go to sleep. And that's not what my patients need. They need to be functional and happy throughout the day and not having to go take a nap. So we specifically made soothe for a daytime pain reliever. And again, the patients are overjoyed. So we have a ton of other things on our roadmap. We have a line for sex called Smolder, which is a one, two punch. One is a vape pen to get you in the mood. And the second is a um, vaginal insert that um, goes right into your bloodstream and also provides lubrication for patients who are um, maybe older through menopause. And then the last line that we have is called Heal, and Heal is a bunch of things um, for chronic medical conditions like diabetes. Um, there's actually something we're looking into as far as an appetite suppressant, which would be amazing. And we have just a ton of different delivery systems and different products, but just basically the whimsical and the kind of, I don't want to say snarky necessarily, but it's basically uh, an approach of don't tell us, don't you men tell us women what we need. Us women can do that just fine. And here it is. And we're just going to continue with that marketing. It's, it just, it really seems to be working. It's what, it's what Gina and I would want. Like if right. we went to a dispensary, this is what we would buy for ourselves. Right. Yeah, this stuff sounds fabulous. What are the pr what's the price point on the pens? The pens are thirty five dollars at our dispensary. They're disposable. They're meant for, you know, discretion. You can tuck them in your cosmetic bag, and they could be a tube of lipstick or anything yeah. else. And they just don't they don't smell like cannabis or taste like cannabis. So if you want to be discreet, you're really going to be able to use that. Nobody's going to know what it was. Wow, that is great. And people can't order this through the mail. Isn't it no, depressing? No, but we are debating on a yes. CBD only line. But the THC and CBD in com combination cause what's called the entourage effect, and you get the best of both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with the plant does know what it's doing, so to get the most components of that plant in there is a good thing. But yeah, we're we're um, 
thinking about a CBD mm-hmm. line that you would be able to get, Nicole. So, yeah, I guess I have to come to Maryland and <laughs> yeah, come to Maryland, <laughs> pick up my stuff. <laughs> All right. So tell me about the greenhouse wellness experience. Like what does a patient, what is the experience like for them? It's different. Um, What we did and our criteria in finding a space was we wanted bathed in natural light. We wanted you to walk into a bright, cheerful environment. And so what Les and I envisioned, never having been to a dispensary before, was we wanted a lot of windows and chandeliers and white leather and granite countertops. And we wanted it to just almost be med spa-like. We wanted somewhere your mother would be comfortable. We wanted it very welcoming because the average age is something like 60 of our demographic. It's getting younger for sure. But we see such older patients and such sicker patients. And it's so funny, Nicole, because when they come in for the first time, you can watch them visibly relax. Like nobody knows what they're going to be walking into when they <laughs> walk into a dispensary. And you can see when they when they walk through the doors and they look around and they have smiling faces and there's crystal chandeliers and it's light and airy and beautiful and clean. Uh, they just visibly relaxed. And they said, this is not what I was expecting, but this is so welcoming. I just feel so comfortable here. And that is a win. And there are live flowers everywhere, orchids blooming. We wanted our patients to feel good about being there. Right. And not dirty or tawdry. We just really wanted to change the stigma and just elevate this whole industry from beginning to end. And we're stubborn So we definitely have our (laughs) eye on the prize, Nicole, every day, and we're stubborn. Mm -hmm. And so we just aren't going to change that. It's that's who we are. It represents who our patients are and it's working. So a new patient might want to have a consultation with somebody and it could be with me. It could be one one of the nurses or one of the wellness consultants. And they will typically talk about whatever their medical conditions are and maybe what medications they're taking. And they'll usually say, I want to get off this medication. I don't like the way it makes me feel. I've heard that cannabis can help. What do you think? And then we talk about what their history is. Have they ever used cannabis? And if so, what happened? And then we educate them and tell them about all the different forms that cannabis comes in and how it affects your body differently, depending on how you do it. And then we start them very, very slowly. We saw a lot of tinctures. They're easy to dose, and I can get the um, different combinations of the cannabinoids and things in ways that make sense for different disease states. And then once their system gets used to tinctures, then maybe we elevate them to some of the gummies or some of the capsules, maybe an elixir at night. Uh, and some of the old timers come in, and you wouldn't think it, but boy, they sure enjoy the seventies and they want to use the flower. (laughs) And so we don't judge. We have something for everyone. Right. We carry over 300 products in the store. Wow. Um, 12 different types of RSO right now for our different hospice and and, um, cancer patients, as well as a full range of edibles, vapes and flowers. So you can find for whatever disease state you have. And if you go on our website, There are unscripted customer testimonials. Probably for me, the most dramatic is watching people come off of opioids totally and then off of cannabis. So they've freed themselves. And then Parkinson's and MS, it's just life-changing what you can see. I mean, we, we really do cry every day. There's Kleenex at every station because remember when I was telling you how humbled I was to have been a part of so many amazing births in my OBGYN career, my experiences at Greenhouse now trump that tenfold. It's the most important medicine I've ever practiced. And it's so cool that I've gotten to share that with the other wellness consultants because even though they're not doctors, they are in a way practicing medicine and impacting people's lives in a way that traditionally only physicians got to do. So it's been really fun for me to share that experience with the staff and watch it contaminate them and infect them because they're, um, they're better for it. I mean, it's a hard job because not everybody's roses and sunshine, mm, but I'm you sure. are able to make a difference in somebody's life and they come back 
and they're better at when you sleep really well that night. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, Pura Vita, that is a business where you have some products for the skin. So yes. what does CBD do for the skin? Like, what are the benefits? Well, funny enough, it's really good for acne. Oh, really? Really good. Yeah, it's an anti-inflammatory. It's calming. And your skin has tons of CB1 and 2 receptors in it. So it actually, um, the different cannabinoids um, act on those receptors. CBD is a little bit different. CBD um, acts on different receptors in the skin, but the overall effect is that you can clear up kids' acne, like my teenagers that were so resistant. If I can get them to use our acne line with the CBD in it, it, it's unbelievable. Um, there's actually one of my um, estheticians does a CBD facial that's very, very popular. Everybody Ooh. wants that. Um, but yeah, it's it's a it's a wonderful adjunct, and it's so weird how the different businesses are all related. But I'll have talks about sex at Pura Vida, and it'll be standing room only, and they want to hear about the cannabis products that are going to help their sex life. And they want to talk about vaginal rejuvenation and they want to talk about skincare. It's just, it's, it's crazy wow. how, how it all intertwines. Yeah, that is amazing. So let me ask you guys this. Do you ever smoke your product? Oh my gosh. I don't like to smoke. It's I a don't weird smoke. thing. <laughs> yeah. So, um, it, it turns out the smoking is not like one of our favorites. My daughter does not actually understand me. Um, but I really like the vapes. Mm -hmm. If I'm in trouble, the, um, I mean, like truly we use placebo. I mean, that's like our go-to. Our go-to. Yeah. It's, it's what I wanted (laughs) and it wasn't on the market. So we had to make it ourselves. And I suffer from terrible migraines and soothe really helps me with those. Now we both have our can, our medical marijuana card or cannabis card. Mm -hmm. And that's required to use medical marijuana here in Maryland. But Mm -hmm. it's funny at, you know, I've never smoked in my life, so that's just not an ingestion method that I would choose. But mm. if I need or want to relax, I might try a gummy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's that's actually a funny story, Nicole, is how completely ridiculously <laughs> sensitive I am to ingested THC compared to my friend over here, Gina, who has a really huge tolerance. And it has always been that way. It's like your receptors are just set way differently than mine are. But um, those ingestibles, those gummies to sleep, you've never had such great sleep in your life. I mean, you wake up clear. Oh, my God. And you're not drugged. You don't have like that weird Benadryl fog from taking antihistamines at night to sleep. It's just it's so, yes, we do smoke our own product. That's the way you're um, you're classifying it. But um, certainly there have been things over the course of the year, maybe more in the beginning that I would try maybe more than Gina, but there's nothing that I need except for placebo and some gummies. Well, and the truth of the matter is I'm approaching my 60th year and I have never used cannabis. And so I just yeah never jumped in the palm. Yeah, I think it's a lot healthier than alcohol though. So as right. far as avoiding calories, <laughs> it's um, <laughs> definitely, yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. All right. So what would you guys say are three key things you need to succeed and survive in business? So Don't that- take no for an answer. Oh. Number one. Okay. And that's true, right? Be true to yourself and don't take no for an answer. If you know what you want and you have your eye on the prize, you've got it. Yep. And, and don't give up. So number two then is grit. Oh, absolutely. Grit. You have to be, you have to have grit. You can't quit when things get tough. You have to pull yourself up, dust yourself off and keep moving forward no matter the cost. And if your listeners have a moment, try the grit survey. You can just Google it. It's 10 questions and it's astounding how it kind of settles you on the grit scale. See, now I can't tell if, it, if it's grit that we have or if we're just stubborn. No, I don't know. <laughs> Could be one and, the same. and probably the final thing is surround yourself with people of integrity and kindness. And I was going to say, I love that Gina always takes that spin <laughs> to it, but I will say as the practical one, surround yourself with people who know what the heck they are doing. Okay. Because 
I did not know what I was doing and Gina did not in, in some ways know what she was doing. And so what we did is we brought people into our circle that did and then we relied heavily on them. So it's the best advice I ever got. When I was starting um, Pura Vida way back in 2008, I was told two things, be like Nike and just do it and to surround yourself with people that know what they're doing. And I never forgot those. <laughs> nice. I think that's great advice. Thank you so much for sharing. So do you guys feel like you are doing your purpose work? I do. And it's not somewhere I ever, ever, ever thought I would be. And you know, Nicole, it's so interesting that you asked me that because it's almost as if there's like one thing. I know our kids are really floundering right now because I think it's probably hard to have parents that are so successful and um, driven and focused. And like my daughter, I can tell you is a like gypsy, you know, she um, flits from thing to thing and it doesn't have that weird passion that her mom has and that's okay. But I think the answer to your question is that if you are true to yourself in however that looks in however you show up at whatever moment. If you are being you and being impeccably you, then you are doing your life's purpose work. And yes, at this moment, what Gina and I are doing is absolutely amazing, but I wouldn't be surprised if it evolves into the next thing and the next thing. And as long as we are aligned with kindness and doing good for the world and leaving the world better than we left it, it'll just continue to evolve. So I like to make people feel a little bit better that they don't necessarily have to be at a certain place to feel like they are doing their purpose work. No, but just to be wherever it is that you are there, you, wherever it is that you are, there you are. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. I love that. Um, so this is the Oh Hell No podcast, and I always ask my guests to share an Oh Hell No moment that they've had along their journey. You guys shared some moments earlier, but I'm sure you have tons of them. So can you each please share a moment that has taught you something or changed your perspective on something? And of course, an Oh Hell No moment is the moment you think, Oh Hell No, did this just happen? Could be positive, could be negative, but it's a part of the moment on our journey that we have to kind of throw us into whatever it is that we need to be thrown into. You know, when we embarked on this wild cannabis journey, I didn't realize that we were different being women. And so I just assumed the playing field was even and level. And I found out that the guy down the way in the dispensary next to us was getting product for half of what I was being charged. And so I called up the manufacturer and I said, hey, I'd like to know what the price is on this product. And he gave me a price. And I said, well, that's double what you're charging the guy next door. And he said, well, he bought a big quantity. And I'm like, I'm bigger than he is. I'll buy that quantity. And he goes, well, we don't have any. And it was like, oh, my God, mm -hmm. I've just been dissed. And mm -hmm. I didn't see it coming. Mm -hmm. Wow. But you, you really drew a line in the sand that day, didn't you? I sure did. Oh, hell no. <laughs> right. <laughs> this way. Yeah, it almost doubled your um, does your drive to right. be a huge success. Yep. Yeah. So my Nicole was um, that this industry is driven by recreational users and a recreational mentality. And sadly, it's not based in medicine or in science or in fact. Mm -hmm. So I am constantly up against that. And it's incredibly tiresome and draining. And one point when Gina and I had gone to the processor that we're working with, and we had said, this is what I want you to make me. These are the ratios. These are the things I want you to add. The amount of pushback that I got to put the CBD in it and to have the ratios as low and to have the potency as low was exhausting. And they said, it'll never sell. Nobody wants this. And I said, I've done the research. I've done the studies in my brain. I know this is going to work. 
And that was my, oh, hell no, because it like, honestly, at some point, it's easier to just roll over. Oh, my God, to be the round peg and a or a square peg and a round <laughs> hole. There you go. Right. It's like hard to be the different one all the time. And it's and I felt like I was being difficult. And I said, oh, hell no to myself. I'm going to do what I want to do, what I know is right. And now we have product on the market where some of our heaviest users who in previous days, I guess we would have called stoners or whatever, have said that your product is the only thing that works for my anxiety. And believe you, I, you know, I've tried everything they say to me. And uh, that's, that's a nice compliment to hear. It is. Yeah, I'm sure. It's amazing when you're doing work that's like helping people. And, you know, they come to you and say, oh, my gosh, you know, I took this and it I was able to sleep or I was able to function or I was able to calm down. Like, that's amazing to me. I think you guys are doing some awesome work. And thank you so much for taking the time out to come on my podcast and talk about your journey. I really appreciate you guys. And if you ever want to come back, if you develop some new products, let me know because I want to hear about it. <laughs> And I'm definitely going to come visit you guys because I got to see this stuff for myself. Anytime. Anytime. We'd love to have you. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So tell everyone where they can find your stuff online just to see and maybe even take a trip down if they need some help. Give us the information. We can be found at greenhousewellness.com. We also have um, blissiva.com B-L-I-S-S-I-V-A.com and we wrote a book called High Heels H-E-A-L-S and you can find that on Amazon and it's available in paperback Kindle and audio mm-hmm. so the high heels is kind of hysterical again you know that's our third hell no I know. moment because remember we said we knew what we wanted the cover to look like we had like Gina and I like we know what we want like we knew that we wanted a book that you would want to like reach and grab so we wanted it to be bright and colorful and we had this idea and our marketing team said no and they came up with something that we looked at we're like oh my god oh no. hell no, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> so we won in the end but yeah high heels is a pretty funny um, read about tongue in cheek. Tongue in cheek. It's it's the behind the scenes look at what it was like to enter into this industry. Oh, fabulous! That's got to be good. <laughs> yeah, funny. Yes. All right, ladies. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a great night. New Jersey, if you love online poker, we've got game. Poker Stars, the world's number one poker site, is live in your great state. Shake off winter when you play our New Jersey Spring Tournament Series starting April 11th and win your share of $2 million in guaranteed cash payouts. Ante in now and get $30 free play on your first deposit. Plus, your next deposit matched up to $600. Now that's a winning hand. Download the Poker Stars app or play online at pokerstars.com. Pennsylvania and New Jersey only. 21 over. Terms and conditions apply. Gambling problem? Call 1 800 Gambler.